So hi there, Dan. We've uh, we've got Dan Hughes here, and we're going to have a little chat today. About Hello, Sarah. Hello, hi, Dan. A little chat today about the uh, the current situation, the coronavirus, and how difficult things are feeling across the world. Um, I was in a situation yesterday, Dan. It's Mother's Day here in the UK, and I think it's Mother's Day on different days all across the world. Australia, America, all have different different dates for that. Yeah. And it was a difficult day for a lot of people. You know. It's, it's often a difficult day for kids in the care system, kids who aren't with their birth mums, so they're wondering how they are. But I think extra worry yesterday for so many people who couldn't connect with their mums, couldn't find out how they were. Um, and I had a young Syrian man I was in contact with who um, had come from a very difficult background. He'd come from the war in Syria, hadn't seen his mum for quite a few Mother's Days. Mm. And he, he came round and he said to me, I have to, um, I can't be with my mother today but I recognize you as a mother and I want to honor you as a mother. He said, I want to make you baba ganoush, which is this wonderful um, Middle Eastern spicy aubergine dip that he makes with paprika and garlic. And he made it for me in my kitchen and shared it with me. And it was just this wonderful kind of, I was so touched that he came from this place of absolute terror and mm. uncertainty and isolation. And yet he could reach in inside himself and connect with me as a mother as a way of reaching his own mother maybe and mm. um and find some empathy and some connection with me on mother's day it was a very very special experience oh that's lovely and and he has been staying with you isn't that right so it may be gratitude as well yeah absolutely absolutely yeah a very lonely time in his life and um wonderful just, yeah very moving experience and to understand something his experience which is very hard for us in the world to live in Mm -hmm. We're getting a flavor with this coronavirus of some of it, but it's, it's so hard. Right. So, right. so many people right. have that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was hoping to speak with, with uh, foster and adoptive uh, families because I have spent um, all my professional life getting to know them, supporting them, trying to understand what it's like to be a foster adoptive. Uh, family, when you have children who don't quite know how to trust and don't know how to be in a family, that is very, very hard. Well, now we have something that's very, very terrifying. Mm -hmm. The same families, and you and I as well, don't know what's happening, don't know what's mm -hmm. happening with our loved ones, with ourselves, with, with our careers, with our, with our life, with our community. And the, we all are in that. And along with that, these foster and adoptive families have this sort of the, um, the ongoing sense of how hard it is uh, prior to that, during that, and after that. In fact, this situation with the COVID-19 virus is making the hard times they've had probably even harder because the children in their homes often who still don't trust them as well if they've been hurt early in life are probably more anxious themselves. And when they get anxious, they probably uh, don't regulate as well, don't make sense as well, or more reactive, more, um, more easily upset. It comes out of fear. It comes out of uh, sadness and confusion. Also, the routines are changed. Uh, they may or may not be going to school, and the school may or may not be the same. And, they're not able to see their friends. If they have contact with their parents, they're not able, their biological parents are not able to see them. And there's similar situations with adoptive children too, who may come from other countries, who, who may be more aware of uh, the uncertainty of their life. They've been uncertain for quite some time, possibly since birth. And there's maybe finally getting some sense of stability in their adoptive home. And all of a sudden that's, that's uh, it's rocking, it's shaky. They're not sure what's going to happen. Partly because the adoptive or foster parents are anxious themselves. How could they not be given this situation? So they have to be able to stay regulated and focus on the needs of their very anxious children while at the same time trying to prevent their own anxiety from becoming contagious, which would make it even worse for their children. So we're talking about terrifying times uh, that are the background and the foreground of uh, a family that already has had very, very hard times, many, many challenges uh, that they've struggled with, mm -hmm. and are probably in many ways still struggling with, made worse by the social isolation they now feel, 
social distancing is one thing, but isolation when it's when you can't see uh, many of these foster and adoptive parents cannot see their own parents now because of social isolation. So they're not able to visit. Uh, they have to be, they're secluded within their own home. Mm. And so that is a very difficult situation then for them to be in uh, having all that. Um, the usual supports they have, you know, you say to a foster or adoptive parent, well, see your, you know, support people. You, you need support people. Well, they had them before. They may not have them now. They can't visit their sister or their best friend who lives on the other side of town because they're not able to now and they're not able to go in their home or have them come into their home. So there's so many difficult things now. It just, it, 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 it leaves me feeling that my anxiety, somehow I have to set that aside for a bit and let these foster and adoptive uh, parents their and, and their whole family if they want their children to, to hear what I have to say, uh, let them know that I, I get it. And I'm sure you get it, Sarah, that how extremely hard a time this is for them on top of the hard times they've already been having. Um, more specific things uh, is uh, most of us, and if I'm a foster adoptive parent and I have children to raise or special needs, there's a good chance there's some financial worries just of living. And now all of a sudden, possibly I, I, I risk to lose my job and certain things I can't get. Uh, so I have background financial problems that may be moving into the foreground. And now I have to deal with that anxiety and, and uncertainty. How do I take care of my family? Well, it's huge. Some of them are I, saying to me, it's rental food. You know, that's what it yes. comes down to. How am I even going to feed the kids? Yes, so I have to friends. worry about, wow. I may have to wor worry about just basic things like that. So basic. Um, so on top of the other ones, I have those very realistic worries. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and it's it's sad. Uh, the the realities are under stressful times when people are anxious. It can bring out the best in people, as is evident by foster and adoptive parents who become so strong for their children who need them to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also can cause people to be more frightened and more exclusive. Uh, how do I say it? Exclude differences in other people. So they may be finding uh, that their, their community they live in is not as receptive to their children, for example. Uh, uh, possibly they adopted a, a girl from China and now there may be a strong prejudice against people from China. Sure. Or and other if, Asian countries as well, I think, Korean. Yes, other Asian countries as well. Uh, yeah. Of course. The sort of sense of othering, isn't there? People the sense of the other. So if this foster family, well, by definition, I have a foster child, that's sort of another. Maybe an adoptive child, maybe not so much, but maybe just as much in some communities. Mm. Uh, and especially if the foster adoptive family has uh, is mixed racial, is uh, different culture, uh, different religion, uh, then the prejudice, the bias, the being excluded uh, may well be even even more uh, more extreme than it is uh, for the rest of us who who are experiencing social isolation and finding that very difficult. Yeah. Absolutely, Dan. It's such a huge range of experiences that we we can only guess at. I guess we have some experience of hearing our, our family stories. Um, there'd be so many more that are really hard for us to understand. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, you too, Sarah, I mean, you, you've known many, many foster and adoptive families with children who don't trust who find it hard to take care of them with their hearts and continue to be rejected by these children. So we understand that. But what we don't understand is you have that already. And now put on top of that. This new experience. This new experience. New terror and uncertainty. Yeah. Yes. Yes, like yes. Safety. And then, as we know, when you have more than one trauma, it can be exponentially more difficult. Sure. And so on top of that, you have these families now struggling with these real fundamental aspects of living that are, that are frightening. Yeah, absolutely. And, the, and we talked before, Dan, didn't we, about the schools and colleges closing and how hard yeah. that is. But 
foster care yeah. parents and birth parents to be alone with their children and not have that regulating sort of right. contact with other adults who can help them with right. feeding the kids. The kids get a hot meal at school. The teachers and school staff often really help them make sense of their right. kids' behavior. They're just such right. a valuable support for parents and parents, right. aren't they? Yes, the, the routines of school and, uh, and the, uh, you know, as we know, the, uh, you found in foster and adult family when when the when the their child who tends toward uh, uh, who has a background of unresolved trauma, their child is likely to have a hard time with free time, ambiguous time, mm. and now they have day after day after day with no external schedule, nothing having to do with school or uh, this this is sort of it goes on and on and on, but it's not a summer holiday. You know, it's a, what's going on and on is, is uh, ongoing anxiety and uncertainty. So until September, and, you know, yes. All these so what do we do then? And, you know, yeah. a lot of them are leaving school at the end of their primary or secondary mm. school. You know, so they're not getting those endings either. Yeah. A lot of our yeah. in care have not had good endings anyway. So a yeah. lot of families are saying, right. we're not getting the endings. You know, we're not going to get to say goodbye. We're not going to have the ritual. Yeah. That's such a loss. Well, uh, uh, I wish I had a great, great way to make this go away. Or I would do it, you would do it, the world would do it, our mm -hmm. leaders would do it, but we don't. And uh, we know the social isolation is not good, but we know well, what are our alternatives? We may die or our loved ones may die. So, so what do we do then? Yeah. And uh, I think what we do is what we believe in already, but do it even more. We're not, there won't be a magic answer here. There won't be sort of pretend it and make it go away. Uh, hopefully we don't give up. Uh, but it'd be great if there was a place, a time, a person with whom maybe it's on, on the phone in the other room so the children don't hear it, when I could scream and then I could cry and maybe even swear a bit to get out a bit of this is really, really hard to give expression to that. Then take a deep breath and then get back into the game, the game, not game, I shouldn't say game, get back into the race or, or the, the, the challenge, the marathon of continuing to move forward with kids who have lost their way or now very anxious and angry and frightened and uh, confused. Well, what we have done for years is sort of a foundation of how to address that as pace, is an attitude that came out of this model of therapy that I founded years ago, which is based on having a lightness, a hope, which is a sort of a background playfulness. But the, at, at, at a time like this, the deeper bit is being able to accept the reality that I have. So I'm not re spending my time regretting and, and, and being defeated. Mm -hmm. I have to be able to accept what the reality is and be curious about how to make sense of it in a way that might lead some sort of a a way forward that will help me get through the day. So curious uh, about, you know, yeah, finding the way forward and having empathy, certainly for my child who's having a harder time and for myself who's having a harder time. Mm -hmm. And just for, you know, just uh, an attitude like that can help me not sort of react as much to the situation or behavior in myself or my child and it helps me to develop a sense of uh, uh, being aware of the mind of my child and the heart of my child. And so I'm open to a relationship with them that can sort of move beyond the behavior and maintain a relationship. Mm -hmm. Pace really helps with that. Even when we wobble, even when we make a mistake, it helps us get up again. If we accept the fact I made a mistake and I treated the child in the way I didn't, I'm curious about what caused it and how to prevent it. And then I uh, have empathy for myself. I'm not a robot, I'm not perfect. I made a mistake, I love my kid and I wanna do better next time, which is a good model for my kid as well. Um, anyway, it's so important. Uh, we have to find creative ways, I think, to show we care when we can't give cuddles, when we can't sort of lean against each, lean against each other and watch a movie together. Mm -hmm. You know, we need that space mm -hmm. uh, between us for, for safety, even within the family. So how do we show it with our eyes and our voice and, and 
things we say that shows the child are in my mind and heart, you know, through it all. I don't forget them. I don't, I don't, uh, not giving up on them or our relationship. Through it all, we're all t- together here. I'm holding them in my mind and heart. Uh, I think it also helps, we have to, well, what do we do with it when a child is scared and sad and confused? What do they need from us that's really gonna help them to trust us? Probably one of the core things is comfort. Mm-hmm. So we have to find a way to get that warmth going and get the, the empathy going so we can comfort a child who may be pretty challenging when they will allow us to comfort them, when they're ready, when they're allowed to be vulnerable. And, oh, as I've said, we also have to help ourselves uh, to accept comfort from somebody we trust. And it, it'd be lovely if they'd be in our, in our house with us, but it may be not happening. So then, mm-hmm. then do it on the phone. And if, and if they get into problem solving, we say to our best friend, just listen to me. I just need you to understand how hard it is. And, and ask for some comforting. You know, you can't give me a hug, which I know you'd want to, but I know your voice, you, show, you, you can communicate your love and your voice and your understanding. Uh, that lovely message of listen to understand rather than yeah. listen to reply. Yes, 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 it's a good way to say it. Stressed. Yeah. yeah, I'm not here evaluating, I'm just understanding. Just being with you in your space and together, if we need to explore new alternatives, possibilities in this, in this very, very hard time, then they may emerge from that because we're safe together and we're putting our minds and hearts together with that. Yeah. Um, I mentioned the kids need schedules, they need routines. Uh, it does settle them, it really does. They need our physical presence, we can't cuddle them, but if, if we have the eyes and, and they hear a voice, uh, that they may really help. But beyond that, routines are so important, but we need to sort of, I don't know I say, spice it up a bit once in a while with, with rituals. Mm. Rituals are, are the things that don't necessarily happen every day, but they happen every Tuesday. <laughs> or they happen, you know, once a month or whatever. There's special things that are, that represent our family or our heritage or our community or uh, just something that sort of, it gives us something to look forward to that's special. So developing those with our kids, finding time, no matter how hard it is, even if it's 10 minutes to do something to, to let our child know they're special. And oh, by the way, kid, our family's special. There's something about our family that is, we're claiming you and, and, and hopefully you're happy to be claimed in this family. You're part of this family. Yeah, so you know, I think it's special to that family and unique about that family and that child. Yeah. Yes, yes. Is Which is, again, Sarah, as a therapist working with these families, I think you probably became aware over the years that a key part of our ability to help them is help them to realize what's unique about themselves. Mm-hmm. What do they have to offer their child and themselves? And, uh, and we have to experience that. We have to find what's unique about the family and help them to be aware of it so they don't forget it. You know, they have to, because that's what a family is about. You, you take your, your heritage, you take your, your, your ways of living, you share it with very important people and you develop routines and, and, and rituals that sort of bring it alive day after day after day. Mm-hmm. We need those even more, I think, during these terrifying times. Do, and that's what creates that safety, isn't it, Dan? We, we uh, uh, yes. That, which is very elusive at the moment. That's what we need yes. so much so we gotta, at the moment. We have to find a way to, to experience safety in spite of it all. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, any other ideas before we finish? Well, um, well, like the way we were, ta- we're talking now, Sarah, it's sort of we're having a conversation, really. Uh, we're not talking about a list of things to do. I'm not giving a lecture. You're not giving a lecture. You told a lovely story at the beginning about this young man from Syria. And it, it's sort of like, I think we have to remember that human beings do well in conversations and developing stories. And um, if we could hold on to that, that's how we stay connected to each other. 
and find some space and and within these dark times uh, for mm -hmm. stories. So are developing the meaning of what we're doing together and the value of it. Sure. I think that that would be my final thought. The 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 beauty of storytelling of stories that that I think keeps us grounded in in what is really meaningful, the heart of it, and it keeps us strong so we could be persistent and take a deep breath, make a mistake and go on again and have the strength our kids need. And that's the really key bit as well, I think you mentioned make a mistake and repair. So yeah. At the moment parents and carers are going to be so stressed and they will make a lot yeah. of mistakes and it's that yeah. repair that, that carries on the story. You can come back from they, it. Right. And, and they certainly will. Right. Uh, yeah. And and uh, if you're still seeing any of these families, Sarah, you may not be able to see them in person, but you may be able to see them on Zoom or mm. even on the phone. Mm. Uh, and, but it's different than in person. So you're going to make mistakes too. You're trying to help them. You're trying to be there for them, but you're not in person. Plus, you're not living the life they're having. It's hard for you and it's frightening for you, but it's not the same. It's not as intense. So you're going to make mistakes. So if you're a professional or a friend, or somebody helping a foster adopt a family, you do your best. And then when you make a mistake, you say, that wasn't on target there, was it? I'm sorry, you know, can you help me to understand more what you need right now? And we just stay there, we're in this together and uh, they're doing more heavy lifting than I am. They really are. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we said before, didn't we, that they're asked to be like super parents, superheroes, but they're not. They're human beings. We're all human beings. Yeah. Yes. Acceptance yes. Of that and, and try right. to hold on to that when we get, we feel ashamed. We feel we've, we've let each yes. other down or our kids yeah. down. It's finding ways to pick ourselves up and help right. people to help us pick right. up. Right. And, and the reality is if they're doing it day after day, month after month, year oh. after year, they have to be very, very strong. The danger is then everybody expects them to be very, very strong 100% of the time. Mm. And then they expect themselves to be very strong 100%. So they can't be vulnerable. They don't, they shouldn't need comfort. They shouldn't need to be able to, they shouldn't need to scream, cry and swear. Yeah. But yeah. they are like the rest of us. So there has to be space uh, for, for them to be that way with a child build, still being safe. Yeah. And finding ways to to to, to, yeah. to face the, was, the, the terror, and at the same time get your strength back. Yeah, and to share what's going on behind closed doors, you know, that we can be yes. about that and help each other with that. Yes, the bad days behind closed doors, isn't there? Right, <laughs> right, for sure. Yeah, wonderful, Dan. Thank you well, so much. I hope this was a bit helpful uh, to these uh, very resilient, uh, um, remarkable individuals who are uh, raising foster adopted children who faced so much trauma in the past and now are facing this terror that we're all facing. Sure, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, you take care over there in Maine. Okay, you too, in Brighton. Bye, Bye for now. Bye.